Welcome to Inspiration Rising. I'm your host, David Trotter, and we're here to inspire you to rise up in your life, love, and leadership. This is one of the most fascinating conversations I've ever had in my life. If you would have told me 15 years ago that I'd be talking to a modern day priestess, I would have been like, what? Now, first of all, we're not talking about a female version of a Catholic priest. We're talking about a woo-woo, crystal-loving, oil-spritzing, candle-lighting, oracle-card-pulling priestess who happens to be from Australia. Julie Parker is her name, and she's the host of the Priestess Podcast and co-founder of the Priestess Temple School, where she helps women activate their calling as a priestess. She's also the founder of the Beautiful You Coaching Academy, where she passionately trains and supports heart-centered people to become life coaches. I asked her all the questions about the goddess she refers to, what she thinks about Jesus, heaven, and hell, and what it means to be a modern-day priestess. Now, depending on your religious or spiritual or scientific background, you may wince a bit here and there along the way as we have this conversation, but I want to encourage you to hang in there and go along for the ride. By the way, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the Inspiration Rising podcast on the Apple or Google podcast apps or Spotify or Stitcher. Just open up the app, search for Inspiration Rising, and click subscribe. You'll have access to all the amazing conversations that I have with inspirational female leaders who share their wisdom. All right, let's jump into my conversation with Julie Parker. Well, Julie, thanks so much for taking some time to hang with me today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much for having me here, David. I'm really honored. Yeah. You know, the first thing I want to ask you about, because obviously you're located in Melbourne, what is going on with your country and these fires? And it doesn't look smoky where you are, but what's going on? Are you okay? I am okay. Thank you very much for asking in my immediate safety sense. However, we have been really experiencing something on a national scale that is just so devastating and so terrible for loss of life, loss of animal life, loss of land and vegetation. It's been uh, almost apocalyptic, David, in some ways, you know, just the intensity of these bushfires and the size of them, you know, the scale of them has just been extraordinary. I'm not sure whether many people know, but the land size of Australia is actually very similar to the land size of the USA. But we have a much smaller population than you do because such a significant portion of our country in the middle in particular is desert and there's just no water there and it doesn't sustain life. And so if that wasn't the case, I'm sure that our population would likely be much bigger. But land size, we're a very large island, very large country, and it's just been devastating. But we have to have hope and we have to come together, which we are doing, and we have to move forward. And we've been feeling the love. Can I just say that as well for everybody from around the world that might be listening to this now in the States or elsewhere? We really have been feeling your love and prayers and thoughts, your donations for rebuilding. It's been extraordinary. So thank you for that. But yeah, tough time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm glad you're personally in a good spot and it is so much attention has been focused on it in a real positive way. So that's, it's all good. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to ask you about this term priestess. Uh, When did you first sense that you were called or desired to be a priestess? Well, you know, I think there are two layers to this question. I think when it first came into my conscious mind was about six years ago. But really, upon feeling into what a priestess is and what it means to show up in the world as one. I was to learn that really I had been one all my life Mm -hmm. and, in fact, that I'd come from a lineage of women who were priestesses and sacred leaders as well. But really it first came into my conscious thought six years ago and it happened in a very simple and very innocent way. I was interviewing a woman just as you are interviewing me now Mm -hmm. for a magazine that I edit, an online digital magazine, and I asked her a question around what it was that she thought had been the greatest learning 
that had impacted her success as a coach and an online business owner. And she said that it was her learning and work in the world of the priestess. And when she said that word, David, there was something physically and energetically happened to my body. It was the very first time I'd ever heard the word. And it shifted something inside me. And after then, I began to research everything that I possibly could around what a priestess was and what it meant to be one and just completely um, embodied it from that moment forward. Mm -hmm. And so how would you define the term priestess? To me, a priestess is a sacred spiritual female leader. Now, if you were to ask this question of many different people, they would give you many different answers, I'm sure. sure. It's one of those things that it's not, you can't necessarily look up a a dictionary or a Wikipedia definition and it's going to be clean and clear. But to me, in all of my study and work and embodiment in this area, that is what a priestess is. A priestess is a sacred spiritual female leader who in particular opens herself up to holding space for other women to step into their own divinity and explore their own sacredness and spirituality as well. Okay. Now, when I hear the word priest, I'm usually Mm going to think of a Catholic priest, most likely a man, of course, or an Episcopal priest. Those are the two. I'm trying to think of any other denominations that use that term priest, but it's, you know, it's a usually a Christian, I guess a Hindu priest. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think there are Buddhist priests. I don't think that's the use. But so the term priestess is a bit more open in terms of spirituality, it seems like, rather than a particular religion or one spirituality. Would you say that's the case? That is absolutely the case. And so may I give you a little bit of historical context? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Many people, when they hear the word priestess, automatically wonder whether that is the female version of a a male Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. Because when we think of the word priest, we so often associate it with the Catholic Church and the Catholic religion. But in fact, priestesses existed before priests did. Uh, the world of the priestess and priestesses have existed since ancient times. Back pre-Christianity and pre-patriarchy, when throughout the world uh, religion and spirituality was very much practised without a focus on there being one male god that people were focused on. People worshipped um, goddesses and in particular the great mother earth and worked in tandem and conjunction with her and with them and with different gods as well uh, for different needs that they had in their life. And so if you had an ache of the heart, you called upon the goddess of love to support you. If you were in a time of harvest, you might call upon the goddess of agriculture and grain to support you in that time. If you were pursuing a creative Uh, love, you might call upon the goddesses or gods of creativity and art uh, to support you with that. And priestesses in those ancient times were essentially women in communities throughout the world who were known to be channels and messengers of those gods and goddesses. So just like when someone may go to a priest today to feel closer or more connected to God, or to seek counsel or advice, so too did people in ancient time go to priestesses in their communities. Now, they might have gone by the name of priestess, or they may also have been a witch, a wise woman, a medicine woman, uh, a midwife, many, many different names that they may have come across. But really, it wasn't until Um, the spread of Christianity throughout the world and different religions that were focused on one male God that we then saw the world of the priestess suppressed and then the rise of the world of the priest. Mm -hmm. Um, And so 
it's not that priestesses today um, or even in those times are the female version of a priest. Um, it's a much more broad definition mm-hmm. than that. Sure, yeah. sure. So many people in our culture today would use the term God and mm-hmm. and even um, use the pronoun he to reference, you know, a God or source or divinity. Um, and you're using the term goddess and Mother Earth and goddess of love. I believe you said goddess of the harvest. Like, help me understand this term goddess. And are there multiple goddesses? Is it one goddess? Is it, are there gods and goddesses? Are they married? Are they, I'm just, kidding. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, like help me yeah. understand what's going on in your mind in terms of all these different gods and goddesses and how, do, how does that all work for you? Sure. Well, every culture throughout the world at one point in time worshipped both gods and goddesses. So there are Hindu gods and goddesses. There are Roman, that's, yeah, there are Roman gods and goddesses, Greek gods, there are Norse gods and goddesses, there are indigenous gods and goddesses. Mm -hmm. And so depending upon the culture that you associate your lineage and your ancestry with is often, and we hope, you know, um, the area that people may explore and be connected to and call upon and worship. Now, for me, um, I have Celtic ancestry and so I have a particular affinity towards the gods and goddesses of Great Britain, Ireland, Wales, uh, and that pantheon, so to speak. And so when I call upon them in my life and they are, you know, there are dark goddesses and creativity goddesses, harvest, love, all sorts of money goddesses, um, you know, abundance goddesses, health goddesses and gods as well, I call upon them in my life um, to assist me and guide me with certain things. And that is no different to the way that someone may call upon God. And by the way, without wanting to confuse anyone, I also believe in God. I believe that God um, has a a male and masculine side and I believe that goddesses and uh, different gods have different elements to them that can be helpful and supportive to me in my spiritual development. But here's the thing that I think is most important for anyone that's interested in exploring the world of the goddess in particular in their life. And that is that when you call upon a particular goddess um, or see what goddesses might come and support you in your life, really all you are doing is calling upon an area of yourself. So if I'm looking to cultivate more confidence in my life or more self-love in my life, let's say, The Greek goddess Aphrodite is very well known for supporting people with their self-love, their sense of beauty, um, how they view themselves and showing up as their full feminine expression in life. So if I was to call upon her or she was to come to me as a goddess in my life, really all I'm doing is igniting my own wisdom within myself. And, of course, we hear God spoken about in these ways as well. Many times we will hear people say, God is you. You are God. You know, what it is that you call upon for your divine self is what he sees in you and you see in you. Mm -hmm. And so this is just nothing more, David, than an activation of your divine and highest and most spiritual self. Mm -hmm. That is all we call upon these higher powers to be. It's like, how can I show up in my fullest expression in this particular area of my mm-hmm. life? Would you sense that there is one divine being that manifests itself in all these different ways? Or are these multiple divine beings with a hierarchy or multiple divine beings with no hierarchy? You know what I mean? Like, how do you think through the divine nature in that way? There is no real hierarchy from my perspective. 
but this is a this is a complex and and laid question in certain pantheons of god and goddess culture there are so for example zeus in the greek culture was seen to be one of the penultimate gods mm-hmm. but in one of the things that i love is that in most cultures however throughout the throughout the world at different times that they've been practiced or honored And this is something that I very much lean into myself. If someone was to ask, yeah, but who's the go-to? You know, who's the big one? You know, who's the one? Wouldn't you want to go to the big one and not like the small ones, you know? Yeah, yeah. It depends (laughs) upon what you want. It depends upon what you're calling in and what you need. The big one is Mother Earth and her name in all different cultures. So in Greek culture, she is Gaia. In South American and... um, my culture, she is Pachamama. To me, um, in my Celtic lineage, she is known as the Great Mother. And she has many, many different names, but essentially she is Mother Earth. Mm-hmm. Because without her and without honour and worship and connection to her, uh, and you started out by asking me such a wonderful question today about what's happening here in Australia with our great mother and mother earth, Mm -hmm. she is the one that was known to be the greatest power and entity of all. And to me, in my belief and my world, she still is. Mm -hmm. Because if we're going to be able to show up as a human being, having a soul experience on earth, we need her to Mm -hmm. be able to breathe, Mm -hmm. eat, walk, Mm -hmm. water ourselves, Mm-hmm. be part of nature and all. So she is really the penultimate one in all culture. Mm-hmm. How do you um, think about the, I guess I would say, um, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which would be the source of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. How do you integrate or think about that God um, Mm. in the context of Mother Earth and so forth? This is a really wonderful question. And I was raised as a Christian and still consider myself to have uh, Christian beliefs. Mm -hmm. Um, And as I mentioned before, I believe in God and um, Jesus. I mean, what a guy, you know, what a fella. You know, the spreading of love. Mary Magdalene has been an enormous influence in my priestess life, um, hugely so uh, in many different ways. But when it comes to those three powerhouses, I can't necessarily say that there is a specific way that I think about those in the integration of my own practice and my own showing up in the world as a priestess. It's more from the perspective that, I believe that when we show up in the world as a sacred spiritual leader, of which I call a priestess and so many other women are now claiming throughout the world, it is that we truly do have an understanding that you can come to this leadership and you can come to this style of spiritual being from any religion, any faith, any background. There are Jewish priestesses. There are Muslim priestesses, there are Christian priestesses, and there are those that just simply call them, a bit like myself, priestess. And so I'm incredibly open to any woman that is devoted to those three together, separately, or taking touches of that faith and those beliefs in any way. Mm -hmm. I don't personally connect super deeply to them myself, Mm -hmm. but I know many other priestesses who do. Sure. Sure. Great. Thanks for breaking that down and processing that super, super interesting. Um, So as you think about the uh, current life, afterlife, maybe even former life, how do you process that? You know, part of um, at least in American culture, there's a bit of a, it could even just be cultural, a sense of like, heaven and hell, right? Mm -hmm. Is there in your thought process, you know, do you, 
think even in those terms at all? Or is that like, this life is all we have? Or is it more reincarnation? Or you know what I mean? Like, how do you process that? Mm, David, you bring in the questions today. (laughs) I love it. It's it's so good. This is really interesting. Nobody has ever asked me this before. And the answer to it is that, yeah, there are elements of what you talk about there that I think come into the world of the priestess and females thinking and spirituality and leadership, but not in the terms of heaven and hell. So, From my Celtic ancestry, we believe in the higher, middle and lower grounds of existence. So the higher level of existence is where God, gods, goddesses, angels, higher spirit live and that we can call upon for support. The middle ground is where um, we are having an earthly, earthbound human experience. Mm -hmm. And it is also where we can connect, if we choose to, to living, breathing things such as animal guides, plant guides, water, the magic of the earth. So those are all things that are on the earthly middle plane. Mm -hmm. And then we have the lower plane or the underground. This is where our ancestors reside. This is where um, our deep subconscious resides, our Mm -hmm. shadow resides, and there are also spirits um, and animals and other guides that choose that rather than being in the upper realms are in the lower realms. So that's where they choose to dwell and we can call upon those. So from my perspective, I believe that this life that I am having now is just one of many that I have already had and that I will into the future. Am I going to be conscious of those that happen in the future? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to thinking about this cycle of life, of birth and life and decay and death and rebirth, it's one of those things that I think like many other ancient cultures, Egyptian, Greek, and particularly the Egyptians, I think we owe this to Mm -hmm. very, very deeply, the process of believing in reincarnation and that death is simply one experience within one life Mm -hmm. and we will then come forth in another way. Now, this is not a truly deep area that I've gone into for myself, Mm -hmm. but I certainly come from the perspective that death is simply one closing. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily one's end. Before we continue, I want to encourage you to share the Inspiration Rising podcast with a friend. I started this show in January 2019 with a passion to help women and the men who support them be inspired through conversations with female entrepreneurs and leaders and coaches. And the primary way that people learn about the show is through word of mouth. I don't have some big ad budget to spread the word, so I rely on listeners just like you to share how the show has inspired them. So if you're enjoying our conversations, would you mind taking a moment and encouraging a friend to subscribe to the Inspiration Rising podcast on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, or Google podcast apps? And if your friend doesn't know how to listen to a podcast, take a moment and teach them. What I find that's interesting about what you're proposing is it's it almost feels a bit borderless, right? Mm-hmm. It's very open in terms of different experiences and what um, you know kind of works for you works for you and what works for me works for me, um, which is fascinating to process here. And so how do you come from a place of like ethics? of how, like, what is a helpful or appropriate or beneficial way to live in this world based on what you're, you know, processing? Mm. Well, I think the reason that it can feel so borderless is because we're not talking about a religion here. Mm -hmm. Right. We're not talking even about a particular form or type of spirituality. Mm -hmm. For any woman that feels called to walk through life as a priestess, 
it's very much about her own inner path and how she shows up in the world in relation to that Mm -hmm. and her calling to sacred leadership. Mm -hmm. And because she may come from many different backgrounds, have many different religious influences, that's going to look different Mm -hmm. uh, for many different different women. Mm -hmm. But essentially... The true path of a priestess, from my perspective, is one that involves uh, regular self-healing of oneself, making, therefore, your presence as a woman better able to hold space for Mm -hmm. other women on their own journey. Mm -hmm. And so, David, you would know just as well as I do as someone in the personal development arena Mm -hmm. that we have a lot of wounded healers out there right 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 and we have a lot of coaches a lot of counselors a lot of people holding space for people that are doing the very very best that they can Mm -hmm. but really should be looking much much deeper Mm -hmm. at their own stuff Mm -hmm. and doing work on themselves and so as a priestess if you are a true one and you're walking a true path, your first commitment is to self. Mm -hmm. Where do you need to look at your ego, your pride, your smallness, your jealousies, your fears, your projection? How do you need to look at these things within yourself Mm -hmm. so that you are then able to be an empty vessel for others who are exploring their own divinity, their own sacredness, their own work. Mm -hmm. And that's a lifelong path. Yes, it is. That that is a lifelong path. It it, it is a constant returning to wholeness of understanding that we are all whole, that there is nothing wrong with us, but we can always be more sacred, more sound, more whole more better in different versions of ourselves as we move forward. And so it is a path of commitment and it's one that's not done alone. You know, you have to find sisters, you have to find mentors, you have to find other priestesses and guides to come into community with to constantly do this work together Mm -hmm. and on oneself and keep turning up in more sacred and better ways all the time. Mm -hmm. Can I be a priestess? That is a really good question. As someone where it's my understanding that you identify as a man, I don't believe that you can. Now, I am open to being challenged on that. (laughs) <laughs> no, I am. Really? I am open. I am open to someone listening to this and saying, actually, no, that is incorrect. Mm-hmm. Um, a man can be. You certainly can be. Call yourself a sacred leader. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, you know what? It could be. My brain is whirring here. There may be men out there that potentially do call themselves priestess. Mm-hmm. I've not come across one. In mm-hmm. all of my time, um, I don't think so, but <laughs> maybe I'm not sure, but maybe, maybe I love it. I love it. All mm. right, so you have a priest, priestess temple school, mm. and um, I love looking at this on your website, priestess temple school.com, which we'll obviously link to in our show notes. But there are, you know, it's a multi month process, and I love looking at some of the categories of things that you are inviting people into the learning process, you know, with. Mm. Um, When you talk about your sacred archetype blueprint, what does that mean? Yeah. Well, each of us at different times in our lives are all embodying different archetypes. Uh, So we may be, as women, really, really deeply connected to the warrior woman archetype. So we might see ourselves and be showing up in the world as someone who's very bold and strong and assertive. And that may be where we comfortably sit. 
that feels really resonant with us. Mm -hmm. And we might not even necessarily know that that is an an, an archetype, which is just simply a psychological uh, grouping of particular behaviours, you know, that's all that means. That might be very foreign to us and we might be in shadow about that and we may in fact really embody a completely different archetype might be the archetype of the mother. And so we as a woman may feel particularly resonant uh, with qualities of care and nurturing and gentleness, whether we are actually a birth mother or not. Mm -hmm. But we feel very connected to showing up in the world as a nurturer, a carer, a tenderer, a lover in that way. And, again, that type of archetype may be something that we're in shadow with. And so one of the things that we know as a priestess and we explore in Priestess Temple School is that when you can find out which archetype or archetypal energy you feel very resonant with, you can then explore that for yourself to step into that stronger. But also, and this is super important, David, you can then also find out the type of archetypal energy that is least like yourself or the one that ignites you, scares you, bothers you, makes you want to run to the hills or say, oh, no, that is not me at all because that archetype is part of your shadow. That one is actually where the most work gets done. When you say part of your shadow, what does that mean for people who don't understand that term? It's, it's part of your subconscious and it is often where um, you sabotage yourself or that there are parts of you that you are in denial about or that you know exist but don't want to know are there. This is where fear resides in us. It's where our ego tells us things like you're not good enough, you can't do that, she's better than you at that, Uh, that's not for you. And we all have a shadow We all have a subconscious. We Mm -hmm. all have deeper layers of us that we'd rather not know. Mm -hmm. But as I was mentioning before, the path of the priestess involves being willing and open enough to explore those things because until we do and as long as we keep those things in shadow Mm -hmm. and we deny them or push them away, Mm -hmm. the more we remain fractured as a human being having a a soul experience, the more they remain separate and we can't integrate them because our shadow has so much to teach us. Mm -hmm. And it's calling out for our love. It's calling out for our attention and our focus. And when we go there, we learn so much about ourselves and we're then able to integrate deeper parts of us. Mm -hmm. What is the primary archetype that you would uh, align or resonate with? Well, do you know what? It's shifted and changed for me Mm -hmm. over my my lifetime and that's because of this work. Uh, I had different archetypes that were really dominant for me in the beginning and very much in shadow. And as I've done more work, they're more integrated. At the moment, um, as a woman who is in her midlife, I am really, really feeling into the archetype of the sovereign queen or sovereignty or the queen. And so that is where an archetype that is about leadership, it's about sovereignty, it's about feeling comfortable in and of myself Mm -hmm. and being a loving, giving woman and human being but also working on myself to the point where I don't need people. I don't need anyone to praise me. Mm -hmm. I don't need anyone to uplift me. Those things are beautiful and lovely and I desire to be loved and I desire to give love, but this is an archetype that I'm trying to very much work on and embody at the moment where sovereignty, being a woman 
unto myself is really coming into power for me at the moment. So that's mm-hmm. what I'm working on and embodying right now. That's beautiful. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. great. What are and I know there this is a big question. So obviously you don't have to go into all these, but what are some of the key things that you would want a priestess to learn in your program? Things that you're wanting her to develop. We've already talked about definition of a priestess. We talked about the archetype. We've talked about the shadow side. What are some other things that she would need to learn or you'd want her to learn? Mm. Oh, gosh, there are a number of things, David. I think one of the things that all priestesses have is a sacred practice of some kind. So exploring that, how does your sacredness show up for you every day? And whether that's exploring meditation, uh, crystal work, um, work with Mother Earth, um, leaning into the power of your body, your sensuality, your sexuality, how you work with um, your menstrual cycle, how you are connected to the cycles and seasons of the earth. This is something that we explore, like how are you connected to the Great Mother? How are you not just a body walking around? You know, how can you find sacredness in yourself and around you every day? Mm -hmm. That's very important. And then the other part, there are many things, but there's two that are coming to mind that are really important to let you and everyone this, you know, is how will you then show up in the world as a priestess and sacred leader? What is your calling to make a difference? How will you impact the world? in a sacred, spiritual, extraordinary way, what is your legacy? What is your soul calling? How is it that you are going to truly make a difference with your sacredness and your spiritual gifts to everyone around you? Because ultimately in the end, that is really what a priestess does. It's like, yes, you need the inner work and you must do that to work on yourself. Mm -hmm. But then the calling is how will you serve the world? Mm -hmm. How through serving yourself will you serve your sisters and brothers and children around you? How will you serve your community? How will you show up online in a way that truly makes a difference to us all? What are some of the... Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm just going to say because that's where the leadership comes in. That's where if you're going to be a true priestess who is a sacred leader, that's where the leadership comes out. And what are some of the most common ways that a woman sees that play out in the world? Mm, I love this question because I hope that for anybody that's listening thinks that they need to run off to an ashram or that suddenly they're going to live on 65 cents a day and, you know, just be meditation all day and all those sorts of things. It's just not true. You know, David, I, I am a life coach trainer. That's what I do as my main, you know, work in the world, apart from holding space for priestesses. I do them, you know, both in in equal measure and with great love for both of them. But this can look like anything. It can look like, uh, you know, a mother being a wonderful sacred leader. It can look like that you show up in the world as Uh, a spiritual coach or counsellor or guide or that you hold sacred circles for women. It can look like you being a corporate leader um, in uh, a huge organisation where you shift into a space um, where your leadership skills and your sacred and spiritual skills as a leader comes out. And that may look like looking at leadership in your work, your career, your biggest business, your organisation that is less hierarchical, Mm -hmm. that is less top-down, that involves more consultation, that involves more community, that involves more diversity and inclusion and listening Mm -hmm. and expansion, you know, much more sacred openness Mm -hmm. than it does in the traditional model of leadership that we've seen. Mm -hmm. It looks however you want it to look Mm -hmm. where you are truly in a space where you're inspiring and supporting others to open up to their own greatness. Mm -hmm. Julie, do you hate men? Oh, my gosh, no. (laughs) 
Wow. You, it's you, like, you're, you just talk so much about women and goddesses and come on, <laughs> help, help me. Help, I'm, I'm, I'm messing with you, obviously. Of but, course. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think you're, you're married actually. Are, I are, am married. Uh, yes. You, you like at least one man. Uh, yes. No, there's, there's <laughs> nothing that you have said that even uh, puts that off into the world at all. I've sensed that mm. energy. And yet yeah. there's, there's this deep passion you have to help women. Yeah. Um, and I have a passion to help women. And then I you put do. parentheses in. Uh, so uh, I asked that in jest, but at the same time, how do you think of men? Like, you know, you're thinking about women a lot, but how do you yep. think about, how do you think about men? Mm. I adore men and I'm very happily and lovingly married and I have male friends and I've trained male coaches and all sorts of things. But yes, there is no question that somewhere in my blueprint in life, I am deeply called into service for women. And it's something I can't deny. It's something I can't push away. It's something that is just the calling to sisterhood is just so deep within me. And this is something that was the part was a part of women's lives in ancient times, pre-patriarchy, pre-colonization, pre-Christianity so very, very deeply and it's something that I think that many women are reclaiming now for sometimes the first time in their life Mm -hmm. and it's a very, very powerful and strong sense of urgency for women at the moment. But how do I see men? Oh, I see men as sacred, extraordinary beings that have the power to be in their own divine masculine just as much as women can be in their own divine feminine. And I also as well want to honour my own masculine qualities uh, because when we can bring greater balance of those things into the world, then we all heal and we all heal together, not separately. Mm-hmm. Um, because we know that there, there are, you know, just as well as I do, David, that there are enormous elements of male society that is still very, very patriarchal, misogynistic yeah. and um, horrendous towards women. Right. There are also women who are um, extremely afraid of, wish to remain separate to, and, um, you know, very fearful and mm-hmm. pushing away of men for a mm-hmm. variety of different reasons and experiences mm-hmm. of which I carry no judgment. Mm-hmm. But when we can find a way to mm-hmm. come together and coexist and do all these things, then such great healing is going to be open to all of us. And mm-hmm. the way that that begins is by working on ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, so one of the things that you talk about in the priestess program are some rituals or practices that um, you talked about circles. Um, help me understand the role of rituals in the life of a priestess. And I understand that that plays out differently for different women because of the different ways that she would be a priestess in the world because it's different if you're in a corporate environment versus if you're having a meet, pray, love experience or something. Um, yep. You know what I mean? So help, help me understand the role of rituals, though. Mm. Well, you are right to qualify that because rituals are something that mean different things to different people, um, particularly depending upon their culture and, you know, how they show up in the world. But Essentially, we know that even if one does not identify as the priestess, you're just a person, that rituals help us as human beings to create meaning in our lives. They help us to develop sacredness and connection to ourselves and practices. So a ritual can be something as simple as going for a walk in nature every day. That can become a ritual for someone. It does not necessarily have to involve 
what many people I think think about as rituals such as candles and incense and, you know, all sorts of spoken prayer and different things like that, but it can involve that as well. Mm -hmm. For example, at the moment I am deeply immersed in the simple practice every day of drawing an oracle card for myself. For this particular month, I am deepening into the ritual practice of drawing an oracle card every morning. And what is it? What are oracle cards? Yeah. So an oracle card is simply a deck of cards that has different messages or themes in it. So there may be an I have oracle card decks, for example, that are connected to um, sensuality, confidence, uh, different goddesses, uh, creativity. Uh, I've got ones that are connected to um, Celtic themes as a part of my cultural lineage. And so drawing one of these cards at random. You shuffle but, them first? You can. You can Rail shuffle them. them. Or say something? or you, you can. It all depends upon the feeling that I have. Like sometimes I will sit in the morning and I'll see all my decks there. And the first thing that I just feel into, which one's calling me the most? Mm-hmm. And I always go with my instinct. And sometimes it'll be like that one. You must pick up that one. Those other times I just I need to sit there for a moment and feel into it. And then how I then choose a card um, is also dependent upon feeling into it at that moment. Sometimes I will sit in thought and meditation around asking myself questions such as what do I most need today? How can I be in deepest service to myself? What is the message that needs to come through for me in my day ahead? And then, yes, I may shuffle or sometimes I'm given the message, just pick one. It might be top one, might be halfway through my day and then the message comes forth. And all that does for me, David, is give me a little anchor, something to think about, something to ponder something to challenge myself with in the way that I show up in the world. And so as we're speaking in this interview, we're not even quite two weeks into the year and already, interestingly enough, in those 14 days, three times from three different decks, the theme or the word of faith has come up. Now, this is from hundreds of potential cards, hundreds, three times faith. And so not only then does this become something that is a ritual for me to think about on a daily basis and to participate in, I know now that I'm being sent a message that I need to have faith around particular challenging things that are happening in my life. Mm -hmm. I'm being sent a beautiful message, have faith, Hold strong. It's okay. There are things coming through from you here. And so that's just a small ritual. It doesn't take very long, but it allows me to connect with my inner world and gives me an anchor and a beautiful theme to think about for my day ahead. Mm-hmm. It's really a beautiful practice. And so the assumption is, is that with whatever card you draw, you're trusting that the goddess is giving you some sort of message in that card in each each card that you would draw that day or that one card that you would draw? Yes, it may be particular goddess. It might just be a card. You know, like a couple of days ago, you know, I drew a card from uh, a a deck that supports you to develop more confidence in your life and it just simply had a message in it of uh, self-awareness. It was really straightforward. It was just like be more self-aware around how you're talking to yourself, which, of Mm -hmm. course, as we know, is a very, very deep part Mm -hmm. of what impacts our self-confidence. So that didn't necessarily come from a particular goddess at all. But then other times if I'm drawn to a goddess deck, then I might be thinking to myself, oh, I'd like to connect in with the energy of a certain goddess today. Mm -hmm. I'm going to see who comes to me. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So... Julie, you know, I come from a 
really conservative Christian background, like conservative, mm. like, I mean, for most people, it would be really conservative. For me, it doesn't yep. feel conservative because it's just like, well, you grew up in, you know what I mean? Yeah. And in retrospect, you kind of go, whoa. And uh, it's fascinating to hear you talk about these things because, of course, I was taught that you are like, you're the devil. Bottom, sure. bottom line, you not only are you going to hell, but you're taking a lot of people with you. You are, <laughs> you are a scary person, Julie. You are really, I mean, you're so scary. You are really, really scary over there in Australia leading people to hell. Um, yeah, so it's very fascinating to hear, you know, what you're talking about. I was just telling my wife last night, I was processing a bit as I have, you know, expanded my own spiritual beliefs over the last 12 years. And I said, you know, and this is obviously coming from my own experience, background, training, teaching, that it seems like if I eliminate the concept of heaven and hell, which requires from a Christian, at least an evangelical tradition, that you must get the right answer. Like you must Mm -hmm. follow Jesus and head down that path. Now you're in heaven. You're good. Okay. Mm -hmm. If I eliminate the concept of heaven and hell and assume that everybody's good in the afterlife, no matter what. Okay. You're good. Whether you believe that Jesus gives you a second chance or there is no afterlife or you're in reincarnation or, I mean, right. You've got a bazillion options out there. Mm -hmm. Then it seems like from a practical perspective, because I'm a very practical person, that whatever you find that works for you, gives you solace, gives you peace, gives you contentment, creates a sense of well-being in your life, that that is going to somehow work for you in this life. And some people seem to create whatever that is, whatever that sense of peace is at a much deeper, rich level, i.e. what you're talking about is at a very rich, meaningful, deep, passionate level versus somebody who, you know, maybe spends their whole life, you know, I guess the 1980s version would be somebody on Wall Street that's all about money, money, money. And that's and that's where they find meaning. Do they get to the end of their life and find that it was meaningful? I don't know. Maybe some people do. Maybe they don't. Mm-hmm. From, yeah, my, maybe. From, from my tradition, no, they wasted their life, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the same way you're taking people to hell, they just wasted their whole life, you know. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, I don't I don't know. And for whatever reason, for me, it kind of hinges on that, the heaven and hell issue because that's mm-hmm. such a uh, uh, strong thing that Christians, you know, believe. Um, yeah. That if that was eliminated, which obviously that's a ridiculous question for most Christians, but in my process as I'm processing through my own belief system. I look at you and I look at what you're doing and I'm like, that's really fascinating. You know, wow. You're pulling cards and sucking on crystals and throwing (laughs) oil all over yourself. You have not said any of that stuff. I'm being playful. Um, (laughs) But I, I I hear what you're doing and I'm like, wow, that sounds like such a rich life for you. That's so beautiful. And you're helping people develop a rich life, you know, in the same way that other people, who are Christian or Muslim or, you know, I don't, I just don't know, Julie. Counsel I think you do. Counsel no, me think, in this moment, Julie. Come on, help me. Oh, out. I think you do because I think you just said it. David, what you were talking about there is in relation to people finding what works for them, mm-hmm. what gives them solace, what gives them comfort, what helps them connect to their truest and deepest self, what helps someone show up in the world with authenticity and love and care and grace and help and support other people along the way to do that. That's a beautiful life. That's a well-lived life. And essentially what you're talking about there is spiritual health. Mm -hmm. That's someone's spiritual health and well-being. And that, of course, is going to look and mean something different for everybody. I think about the people that I have met numerous times in India who live from what I would call almost an oppression of gods that they must placate in order to survive. And I'm talking about people in huts, right? I'm talking in villages where there's a lot of fear. You know, there's a fear of these different gods. 
Um, and, uh, and I'm going in one way, I go, that's not working for them. That is not working for them. That's creating a lot of fear. And yet on the other hand, that's the culture that they've been brought up in and that fear and then the uh, gift to the God, hoping that, you know, the God will be nice to them. You know what I mean? will bless them in some way that is working for them. Because that's the, that, you know, it's working for them because that's what they were taught. And that, that system, it, that system is working for them in some way. Yes, that belief system is. And what you described there is what I also know is many people's, not everybody's, of course, but many people's, and if I may be so bold as to say many women's experience of Christianity. I you know, agree. The concept or the the saying, the fear of God, comes from somewhere. (laughs) And it's like as young women, um, you know, in various different belief systems within Christianity, the fear of God is put into you or tried to be placed upon you around you will not have sex before marriage, you will dress modestly, you will not have impure thoughts, uh, you will not marry outside of this faith, you will not do this, 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 this. You, you will live. Leader. That's right. You will live with the fear of God within you. And that works for some people. Yeah. It also does significantly not work for many others. Right, right. Yeah, it's so challenging. And so ultimately, I look at all of that and go, everybody's on their own journey, right? Yes. Everybody's on their own journey. Everybody's on their own path. Um, I just uh, had a woman that I met at church um, several weeks ago at the church that my wife and I attend. It's a, a Christian Methodist church. And she said, I'm coming out of Mormonism because my son has identified as LGBTQ. and you know, it just wasn't working for us, you know, yep. for obvious reasons. And so obvious. she she's just crying and she's feeling like I just need a safe place to be able to connect with God in a place where, you know, he's welcome and I'm welcome. And, you know, what I mean, and once again, she's on her own journey. It worked until it didn't work. That's right. And, you know, that's many people's experience of organized religion. Mm-hmm. Not everybody's, but Yeah, for those people that have an awakening of some kind, it may lead them in a different direction. And I'm quite sure that there are many people that have started out a more, you know, general opening of spirituality, whether it be identifying as the priestess or not, that have found a particular organised religion within that and moved into that. It's mm-hmm. not just a case of moving out of. It can right. be a case of moving into. Right. But, yes, we do know that within organised religions that there are many people that um, find that their values, um, their beliefs, uh, how they want to express themselves, their innateness as a human being does not resonate with that for life. Mm-hmm. It may be what they grew up in. It may be what they were taught as a child, but as they move on and get older and expand, um, that it doesn't resonate with them anymore. Mm -hmm. And isn't that the same with so many things in life? There's so few of us that do one thing for life now as a career. Mm -hmm. You know, we might start out studying to be a lawyer and end up as a, you know, a coach. We might start out as a teacher and end up running a bed and breakfast Mm -hmm. in the house, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're not Mm one-dimensional. We are so multidimensional as human. We shift and change as we grow through life. Mm -hmm. What a fascinating conversation with you, Julie. I don't, I, I don't, I don't think you're going to hell. I just don't. (laughs) Thank you. I don't. It it really does. It really doesn't matter what I think. But I just. I don't know. I just don't, I don't know. You know, I don't get all the stuff you do. Oh, here's one last question I have for you. So I, you know, a lot of personal development podcasts, people will say, well, I don't want to get all woo woo on you. Right. People, you must hear that all the time from people. Like, I don't want to get all woo woo on you. And I'm like, that rubs me. I'm like, okay, I'm so confused by that because you're totally woo woo. You're like 
all caps. <laughs> you're, you're all caps. You're the epitome of woo woo. When you hear people say, I don't want to get a woo woo on you. Obviously that's a, um, it's a hedging their bed. It's a safety yeah. thing. It's them wanting to be spiritual, but yet not wanting to rub people the wrong way who don't feel comfortable being spiritual. Um, well, come on. Well, I just gave the answer, but what do you think about that? <laughs> Well, do you know what? I think that woo-woo is something that it very much exists on a scale because, for example, and you are right, when people say that they're hedging their bets and it's okay, you know, I don't, I don't mind, I am, for someone that has grown up, for you, as someone that's grown up in a more conservative uh, religion, I am very woo-woo. But, David, let me tell you something. I am. Not really, truly. When I when I think about some of the people that I know, um, that are really on the scale, I am nowhere near it. Yeah. You know, like um, I put up a post on Instagram. I think you know it was about twelve months ago, sort of busting some of these myths around you know living a spiritual life and being a spiritual. And it's like I love. Australian rules football and okay, go matches all the time. It's like if you invite me to your home and you say, you know, would you like a glass of Chardonnay or a beer? I'd say pop the beer. Thanks. Pass me the beer. Yeah, it's yeah. like I'm so normal. I'm so grounded. I'm so I'm just a, a friend, uh, you know, a normal everyday person. You know, I don't walk around wearing flower crowns all the time and <laughs> floating about and, you know, tr- you know, I've got crystals dripping from me or anything like that. On the woo scale, I'm pretty, I'm pretty soft to t- 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 tell. I'm you're, pretty you're soft. low, you're low woo. I'm low woo, exactly. Or just I think I am, but I understand to somebody such as yourself or maybe to many other people listening, I'm I'm really far along. But there are many, many people that are great to you and all that and bless them because we need people at all, you know, at all sides of the spectrum. And on my own Priestess podcast where I have many guests, I have guests that are extremely women and ones that are not. You know, I had a conservative uh, Christian on, a beautiful guest, uh, about a year and a half ago, and the the theme of our conversation was just God. And all I wanted to ask her was, who is God? Let's talk about who God is to you. And we had this magnificent conversation about who God was for her as a conservative Christian and who he was for me as someone who saw him quite differently. It was beautiful. It was one of the most lovely conversations I've ever had on the podcast. And I want to have people in my life across those broad spectrums. And yeah, so there's a there's a, a scale here. You know, it's not like we're getting on it in someone's way. Oh, it's like you're ten pound woo, or you're fifty pound woo, <laughs> you're a hundred and fifty pound woo. It's not like that at all. But yeah, I'm pretty grounded, David. Pretty grounded. We it's, we could we could go all, to a, we could go to a game together. Yeah. It's all based on perspective, right? It's all based yes. on where you are. Uh, and that's true about even the terms like liberal or conservative, whether it's politics yes. or, you know, religion or whatever it might be. Well, uh, okay, Julie. So uh, we want to drive people to, you've got all kinds of things happening. You've got the Priestess podcast. You've got the Coach Magazine, which is an online digital magazine for coaches. You have the Beautiful You Coaching Academy if you want to learn how to be a coach. And you've got the Priestess Temple School, which is what we've been talking about today. Mm. So we're going to point people toward all those websites. PriestessTempleSchool.com, JulieSuzanneParker.com. We'll have all of that in the show notes. And of course, all of your links to social media as well. Julie, thank you so much. May you be flooded with rain in Australia. (sighs) And uh, may your life be full of crystals and good things. I don't know what else to say. (laughs) Your your life be full of woo. (laughs) Thank you so very much, David. Um, uh, Yeah, it's been a real joy to talk to you. Thank you for being so open and inviting and just having this conversation. I hope that it's been so helpful to anybody listening. Well, thanks for listening to my conversation with Julie today. Whether or not you resonate with the spiritual path that she shared, I do want to ask you a question that she posed during our conversation. 
Julie asked, what is your calling to make a difference? How will you impact the world in a sacred, spiritual, extraordinary way? What is your legacy? What is your soul calling? How is it that you are going to truly make a difference with your sacredness and your spiritual gifts to everyone around you? Well, may you be willing to slow down and reflect on how you can bring your inspiration to the world because the world needs what you have to offer.